Welcome to another episode of Mormon Sunday School. I'm your host slash instructor, Bill Real, and it's going to be a fun ride today. Folks, today what we're going to be talking about is the Gospel Principles Manual, Chapter 10, The Scriptures. And this was a really fun one for me to put together. I think you're going to enjoy it. And so without further ado, let's jump in. So uh, first is the actual Gospel Principles Manual itself. What it is essentially doing us doing to us is telling us how important the scriptures are. Um, it is then it's going to lay out uh, each of the scriptures that make up the LDS canon. And so the first one that it goes into is uh, the Bible, and it says, "Hey, look, the Bible is a collection of sacred writings uh, containing God's revelations. This is from Adam." Uh, all the way through the ministry, resurrection, uh, ascension of Jesus Christ. And so these are the writings of prophets uh, and other messengers who who have written down uh, their messages for us. But most of us know what the Bible is. And so from there, they make a brief mention of the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. This is only in the newer manual. You'll see there on the right. You will not see it on the left. Uh, talking about the Joseph Smith translation. I just want to note a couple of things it says about the JST. It says, through the prophet Joseph Smith, the Lord has expanded our understanding of some passages in the Bible. The Lord inspired the prophet Joseph Smith to restore truth to the Bible text that had been lost or changed since the original words were written. The, in, these inspired corrections are called the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible in latter in the Latter-day Saint edition of the King James Version of the Bible, selected passages from the Joseph Smith translation are found on pages 797 to page 813 and in many of the footnotes. So not only do Mormons, by the way, folks, if you uh, are not Mormon, you just want to know what Mormons believe, Mormons have a much larger... Uh, group of canonical text or sacred text that they utilize within their faith. So not only do Mormons use the Old and New Testament, preferably in English, the King James Version, but also Joseph Smith took by portions of the Bible and uh, under alleged revelation, corrected them to restore them, believing the Bible to be uh, a corrupted and that things were lost, and he was restoring it to its ancient form. And I just want to note, that's important because when we get to the back end of this uh, conversation, you'll notice that lots of things around many of these translation productions by the prophet Joseph Smith, how we understand them, what their role is, how they came to be, those kinds of things have changed dramatically. And so I just want to note, up until the last, say, five or six years, all Mormons were raised with the idea that the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible was restoring the Bible to its ancient form, that it had over the years been corrupted by a corrupt priest. Uh, Mormonism specifically will uh, mention in places it being Catholicism uh, when they talk about the great apostasy, and that Joseph Smith was taking the Bible, which had been corrupted, and restoring it to its original form, restoring many lost uh, things that were precious but had been lost uh, because of, of that process of, of corrupting the scriptures. The, the next thing we're going to talk about is the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith essentially creates Mormonism from the Book of Mormon, and what I mean by that is it's the impetus for everything else that follows. In the 1820s, Joseph Smith claims that he had a, a vision where he sees God the Father and Jesus Christ. And then just a few years later, so that actually he claims occurred in 1820. In 1823, he claims to meet with an angel named Moroni. Moroni tells him where the uh, where a set of gold plates are buried. And uh, by 1827, he is permitted by Moroni to retrieve these gold plates out of the earth at a hill near his home. He then says he translated them by the gift and power of God, which now today we understand means a seer stone, a peep stone in a hat, uh, whereas in the past we used to teach that it was the Nephite spectacles which had been preserved and buried with the plates for that purpose. 
Turns out not necessary. Joseph uses his peepstone, puts it in a hat, and translates the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is a, a alleged historical narrative of ancient Jews who around 600 BC come to the Americas and uh, their spiritual history and uh, like warring history and their, the history of their peoples are all accumulated, written down, etched in reformed Egyptian on these gold plates. Joseph Smith translates them in starting in 1827, finishes the translation, I think late 1829, early 1830, and the book is published in 1830 as the Book of Mormon. It culminates about two-thirds of the way through the book. It culminates with the visit of Jesus Christ himself after his resurrection in the old world. He, uh, he visits the Nephites uh, and, and essentially teaches them many of the same things that he taught his people in the old world in the New Testament. And so the Book of Mormon claims to be a ancient text translated in the modern day, again, in 1830 uh, is when it's published. And it contains not only you know their secular history, but also the, the these people, these ancient people's spiritual history. It ends around 420 AD when the last author named Moroni buries the plates. And he's the same person who as an angel uh, comes to Joseph Smith to tell him where the plates are. And so we have the Book of Mormon. Next, we have the Doctrine and Covenants. So after the church is established in 1830, Joseph Smith uh, begins accumulating what was originally called the Book of Commandments. And these are the revelations given to Joseph Smith about how to organize the church, how to set things up, uh, how to you know, whenever a member or the church itself uh, had questions, when the people of the church had questions, he would then seek revelation and sort of try to uh, set out order in the kingdom based on what allegedly what God told him. So that's the doctrine and covenants. Those would essentially be modern writings in uh, at the time of Joseph Smith or after. There haven't been hardly any in the last, say, 100 years uh, we've had a few official declarations, but no canonized revelations. Uh, this was essentially mostly from the time of Joseph Smith. And then we get a few from the prophets thereafter, Brigham Young, uh, Joseph F. Smith uh, is one of them, uh, John Taylor maybe. But it's, it's the early leaders of the church and their alleged revelations uh, make up the Doctrine of Covenants, which was originally called the Book of Commandments. Next, we have the Pearl of Great Price, and this is sort of a, a hodgepodge of things. One of the things that it contains in it is Joseph Smith's history, uh, which essentially shares the events as Joseph Smith claimed they happened, which leads to the origination of the church and a little bit thereafter. Uh, it contains the Book of Abraham, which Joseph Smith claimed in the 1830s while the saints, the more, the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, often called saints, were in Kirtland, Ohio. While in Kirtland, Joseph Smith bought some mummies and some Egyptian papyri. He claimed that the, some of the papyri was the writings of Abraham written, upon, written by his own hand upon the papyrus. Uh, we'll get to whether that actually holds up or not. Another thing was the Book of Moses, which is a part of the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. And uh, and hence, we've got the Pearl of Great Price, which is a collection of various things that uh, are an additional book of Scripture to the Latter-day Saints. And then it finishes off by talking about the words of our living prophets. And so in Mormonism, Latter-day Saints are always taught that living prophets trump dead prophets. It doesn't matter what the dead prophets taught. It doesn't matter if they were wrong. It doesn't matter if their teachings were abandoned or reversed. Uh, what matters is what the living prophet says. And so while Latter-day Saints emphasize the past prophets, and those past prophets are often quoted, anytime there's a discrepancy, we go with the living prophet, even though someday he'll be dead and a living prophet will trump him. So I wanted to note that. And that really does finish off the Gospel Principles Manual. It really is just explaining to the investigator, the new member, what Latter-day Saint scriptures contain. And so then we have it. We've got the, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, 
We have the Doctrine and Covenants. We have the Pearl of Great Price. And uh, to some extent, Latter-day Saints would argue that the most recent General Conference transcription, which would be found in the church periodical uh, that happens every six months, not the periodical, the periodical happens monthly, but General Conference happens every six months, that the most recent General Conference is also considered scripture. Uh, And so that's why they emphasize the living prophets. Now, I want to spend the rest of my time just telling you about some of the issues with Mormon scripture. And so it's a big claim for Joseph Smith and for the church to say, not only do we use the Bible, but we have all these other books that the rest of the world doesn't utilize, don't really know about, but you should trust us. The Book of Mormon is an ancient text about ancient people. The book of Abraham is the writings of Abraham written by his own hand. You should trust that whatever fixes Joseph Smith made to the Bible, those are accurate. Uh, The book of Moses really was something that Moses did. And the trouble is when you dive into Mormonism, there are lots of issues with each of these translation productions. And we'll go into each of these. So, So let's start off with the book of Mormon. I'm going to explain to you just a few points, and there are tons of problems. If anybody wants to reach out to me for more information, I'm happy in the YouTube comments to uh, reply to you and give you more resources. But the Book of Mormon, five things we'll cover here. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of things that could be brought up. But number one, it contains similar writing styles to 19th century books like The Late War. Number two, it plagiarizes stories from Joseph Smith's milieu, including from his father, Joseph Smith Sr. Number three, it contains stories which would can, would be absolutely absurd in terms of how they could happen. Uh, the example I'll give here is the 2000 Stripling Warriors. Number four, it contains New Testament scriptures, such as the ending uh, of Mark that is not considered to be original. So the last chapter of Mark, which I believe is chapter 16, the original manuscript of Mark would have ended around verse 9, and then whatever came after verse 9 is believed to be an added text after the fact and not original to Mark. It leaves essentially with the tomb being empty, and so we don't get the verification from Mark that Jesus is resurrected. He sort of leaves the audience hanging for them to sort of figure it out themselves, whether they want to believe that Jesus resurrected or not. Uh, It also contains a second and third Isaiah, so sort of the same idea. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah writes out, and I don't know what it is, but it's the first, say, 30 chapters of Isaiah. And then after that, most scholars believe that Isaiah stopped writing, and then years later, someone else comes along, claims to be Isaiah, and adds additional chapters to Isaiah. And then at the very end, the last few chapters are believed to come from a uh, second Isaiah. And so I think that starts with, if I'm not mistaken, with chapter 53 uh, is the first chapter believed to come from a third author quite a bit of time after the original Isaiah. And so this would not have been the original document Isaiah that Lehi from the Book of Mormon would have had access to, to be able to come over here. Let me say that differently so you understand. In the Book of Mormon, the first person recording words is a person by the name of Nephi, and he tells us about his father, Lehi, who's leaving Jerusalem around 600 BC to come to the Americas. Second and third Isaiah, and certainly third Isaiah, are believed to have been written after Lehi and his family's departure date from the old world, hence they should not have any access to 2nd and 3rd Isaiah, and yet somehow it makes its way into the Book of Mormon. And then lastly, we will share an issue with DNA research, which affects the book. So the first thing I wanted to explain is there's a a book uh, written in the 19th century called The Late War. might even be in the late 18th century, but but it's called The Late War. And when you read The Late War, it reads like the Book of Mormon. For instance, one of the things you'll notice immediately in chapter one is the use of the phrase, it came to pass. You'll see it again there, chapter three, the first page, and it came to pass. I think there are 81 and it came to passes in the book, 
when you read the book, it, the nouns are obviously different. It's a different story. I don't think Joseph Smith used this book to write the Book of Mormon, but I think it's it's highly possible he was familiar with the book uh, and its writing style. And this writing style isn't just in the late war. It's in other books of the time as well. There's a lot of authors who sort of borrow a biblical language. And so if one were to pause the, this video and begin reading the late war, and simply substitute the nouns for words out of the Book of Mormon, this would read very much like the Book of Mormon. And one only need read a few of the verses to recognize that. And I would encourage you, if you think I intentionally selected a few pages that have that sort of style to them, I would suggest that you do a Google search and just look up the late war plus PDF It'll come up immediately, and you can read the entire book and see that it does that. So I will just read a couple of verses here. Let me start at the very beginning. Now, it came to pass in the 1,812th year of the Christian era, and in the 30th and 6th year after the people of the province of Columbia had declared themselves a free and independent nation. Okay? And then that in the sixth month of the same year, on the first day of the month, the chief governor, whom the people had chosen to rule over the land of Columbia. If you're familiar with the Book of Mormon, you'll just notice this has that same sort of writing style. The and it came to passes, uh, how it talks about the dating system, the sixth month of the same year, the chief governor, the land of Columbia instead of the land of Zarahemla. Um, you know, in verse four, in the name of the city where the people were gathered was called after the name of the chief captain of the land of Columbia. Uh, and it, it does this from page to page to page to page. I only, I only say that because here's the issue. The Book of Mormon claims to be people from the old world, Jewish or Hebrew people, Recording in Reformed Egyptian on gold plates. And it just so happens that when Joseph Smith translates that, those plates into English, what he ends up with is the exact same writing style contemporary to him in his day. And that is a bit of a stretch, especially when you see how similar these are. Here's another set of pages. You're welcome to pause them, pause it and read those. Um, but again, you'll notice tons of similarities, including lots of, and it came to passes or now it came to pass. So, uh, you know, where's Joseph Smith? Where's that writing style coming from? Is it coming from the ancient old world and reformed Egyptian? Or is it coming from the 19th century? Uh, Joseph Smith's mother in her biography of Joseph Smith. It's uh, the progenitors of Joseph Smith, something along those lines is the name of the biography. Joseph Smith's uh, mother, Lucy Mack Smith, writes down a history of her family and with a, with a hyper focus on Joseph Smith, the prophet. And she recounts a dream that her husband had, the father of Joseph Smith, the prophet, had a dream uh, where there was a road uh, it says, I'll just read the parts that are similar. Broad is the road and wide is the gate that leads to death. This was a dream he had. Um, and many there be that walk therein, but narrow is the way and straight is the gate. He talks about it being a narrow path near a stream of water. It was, uh, he then uh, sees uh, a pleasant valley that was exceedingly handsome. Uh, he sees a tree and the tree bore a kind of fruit in the shape much like a chestnut burr. And as white or white, whiter than snow, it had a dazzling whiteness. I found it delicious, but beyond description, I must bring my wife and children that they partake with me. I beheld a spacious building. I was filled. It was filled with people that were very finely dressed. They pointed the finger of scorn at us. And Latter-day Saints will recognize the similarity inside the Book of Mormon again, allegedly written by ancient prophets, is a vision by that uh, first family. It's Lehi, and it gets interpreted by his son, Nephi. And they see a vision of the tree of life. And in this uh, vision of the tree of life, 
There is uh, an, a rod of iron that everyone holds on to. There is a, a filthy stream. There is a spacious building where everybody is wearing finely dressed apparel and pointing with scorn. And there's so many similarities that the church doesn't even argue this. There, You can go find numerous articles in church magazines, both operated by the church and then operate, operated by just members of the church, where they debate or talk about why did Joseph Smith Sr. have a dream that seems to match up, have a ton of overlap with the vision of the Tree of Life by uh, Lehi and interpreted by Nephi. And the most rational explanation is that Joseph Smith is simply plagiarizing his father's dream and putting it into the Book of Mormon. But what defenders of the church claim is that God just gave a similar vision just so happens to Joseph uh, Smith's father and to the original prophet of the Book of Mormon, Lehi. And uh, that's the apologetic response. But the more rational answer is that Joseph Smith is simply plagiarizing his father's dream and placing it into the Book of Mormon. Then we have irrational stories. So there is a story in the Book of Mormon about the 2000, uh, 2000 stripling warriors. And the 2000 stripling warriors are mostly young men. Uh, they don't have any battle experience. They are thrown into uh, military action as a, as a cohesive group. They go up against a experienced army that's larger that's grown men, adult men, and they fight these men and they not only beat them, that on its own would be hard enough to believe. They not only beat them, but not one of the stripling warriors dies. It notes that many of them fainted from blood loss, um, but no one dies. And they go into another battle shortly thereafter. And uh, essentially they're this invincible army of young men uh, who don't have hardly any battle experience, if none, and seem to just never lose. And so I would ask folks, close your eyes for a moment. Imagine a moment where an actual battle takes place, where 2,000 stripling warriors, young men who have little battle experience, come up against an older, larger, more experienced group of warriors. And I mean it, like try to imagine it in your head. Try to imagine a path to victory where not one stripling warrior is killed. And then while many feign a blood loss in approximately the year 65 BC, not one warrior dies. Not one warrior gets major infection. And they defeat the other side, not having one of them lose their life. How realistic was it what I just asked you to imagine? And the reality is it's absurd. Picture 2,000 people fighting against whatever, 2,500, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000. And imagine in your head that battle taking place. And the other military force is completely annihilated and not one of your soldiers is killed. And in 65 BC, while many of your soldiers did faint from blood loss, nobody dies, nobody gets gangrene, nobody gets an infection and dies. They all live. It's absurd. So the stories in the Book of Mormon aren't believable. And then we run into more issues. Another issue is that, uh, again, Book of Mormon authors did not have access to the New Testament. But strangely, the 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 5 through 11 make their way into the Book of Mormon almost identically. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 5 through 11, was not accessible to Book of Mormon authors. It also would be written in, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Many believe the New Testament was written in Hebrew. It was not, for the most part. It would have, by that time, the common language would have been Greek. And so the New Testament was written in Greek then translated into English. Meanwhile, Joseph Smith is taking uh, Reformed Egyptian from Hebrews, translating it into English. And strangely enough, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 5 through 11, makes its way in as Moroni chapter 10, 8 through 14, 16, and 17. And 
it has no business being there. Um, one would have to, if one wants to argue that the Book of Mormon is an ancient text, one would have to have a reasonable answer for why the New Testament finds its way in significant ways into the Book of Mormon. That's not the only one. Also, Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, again, these are written long after the original author of Mark, and they find their way into the Book of Mormon chapter 9, verse 24, that also has no business being there. And the most rational explanation for this is that the Book of Mormon is pseudopigrapha, meaning that it is a modern creation proposed to be in the voice of ancient people, but for which was a 19th century production, not an actual ancient text. And then lastly, with the Book of Mormon, we have DNA studies. The, the church used to claim that the Native Americans, that the uh, Native Americans were the descendants of the Lamanites. And now what the church said, and the way they used to word it, and I'm sorry if I stammer a little bit, the way they used to word it was that the Lamanites were the principal ancestors of the American Indians. When DNA research came out and Native Americans' DNA was studied, it was clear that 99.9% .9 of Native American DNA comes from uh, Asia. It's, it's Asian DNA. And it's believed that the Native Americans were Asians who came across the land bridge, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. And that over time, evolution has had them differentiate from Asians, um, but that they are essentially from Asian people. Well, this was crippling to this Book of Mormon narrative that the Lamanites or or the ancient Native Americans were the principal ancestors of the American Indians, because you couldn't be the principal ancestor if 99.9% .9 of your DNA was Asian instead. It wasn't a Jewish, European sort of DNA. And the church then made the change that to their scriptures, the Book of Mormon was changed in 2006, that now says the Lamanites are among the ancestors of the American Indians. And while there isn't any scientific evidence for that, it at least is such a weak claim that you can't prove it untrue. In other words, there is no Jewish DNA in Native Americans that dates to the right time. But because you're now claiming that the Book of Mormon uh, geographic area had tons of Native Americans in it from Asian ancestry, and only a small group of people from the old world traveled here and intermixed with them, you can now explain why there's no Jewish DNA among Native Americans. It's pretty weak. There's been solid DNA uh, research done on this, and it seems uh, contradictory to Mormonism's narrative, the DNA does as it seems to indicate that Native Americans on any level are not uh, descendants of Jewish people from the old world. And so we have that. Next, we'll move on to the Book of Abraham. Number one, Joseph Smith got literally everything wrong about the translation from Egyptian papyri. Number two, Joseph imposed falsely that the Egyptian papyri were the writings of Abraham written by his own hand. And uh, on the very beginning slide, I won't show it here, and it was actually just the thumbnail for the beginning of this, but um, again, 1830s, Joseph buys some mummies, he gets some Egyptian papyri. Egyptian wasn't able to be translated quite into English yet, at least not in the Americas. The uh, the cipher that allows you to figure that out is the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone has three languages on it. We knew the other two, hence we were able to take the Egyptian and translate it. And once we had a head start on translating Egyptian, we were able to figure much of the rest of it out. Joseph claims this papyri is the writings of Abraham written by his own hand. But what actually turns out to be is that the papyri turns out to be just a standard Egyptian 
funerary text. And once we understood what everything translates to, both the facsimiles, meaning the images, uh, as well as the writings, turn out to be not what Joseph Smith claimed them to be. Here you can see facsimile number one. On the left-hand side is what Joseph Smith said each of those numbered items translated to. On the right-hand side is what Egyptologists say each one translates to. Same thing here for facsimile number two. Joseph Smith's interpretation on the left, modern Egyptological interpretation on the right. I think one of the more interesting ones, uh, if you can see my, my cursor on that facsimile, this upside down figure here, which is now turned right side up. Uh, Joseph Smith said this was Heavenly Father sitting on his throne. And that sort of makes sense because in the Mormon temple endowment, one arm is raised to the square and the other arm is put out in front of you, making sort of a cupping motion, a cupping shape. And that figure sort of looks like they have their hand raised to the square on one hand and the other hand out in front of them. Well, Egyptologists know this is incorrect. This is actually the god Men, and he is a god of reproduction. What looks like an arm out in front of him is actually his, excuse my language, his penis and it's an erect penis. And the church knows this because the church went through various editions of its Pearl of Great Price, where it just completely erased, removed men's penis, and then put it back, and then maybe at another time removed it again and put it back. But there's been sort of this disagreement at the upper echelons of the church, whether to leave men's penis on while you claim it's Heavenly Father upon his throne. And then uh, this is facsimile number three. Joseph Smith's interpretation on the left, modern Egyptological interpretation on the right. It's just to note, though, the one the the image here on the left in the screen. Uh, there's a few of them that are just kind of made a little larger, so you can quickly see how wrong he got it. Uh, number one, Abraham sitting upon Pharaoh's throne. Actually, it's Osiris, the Egyptian lord of the underworld. Number two is King Pharaoh, according to Joseph Smith. Actually, it's Isis the Great. Number three signifies Abraham in Egypt. Um, it actually, Egyptologists say it's an altar with the offering of the deceased. Number four is the prince of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That's what Joseph Smith claimed. Actually, it is, according to Egyptologist, Mot, the mistress of the gods. Number five is Shulam, the waiter. And actually, it is Hor, the deceased. And then number six is interesting. Uh, Joseph Smith said it was Olamala, a slave. And actually, according to Egyptologists, it's Anubis, the god of the dead. And the reason that this is interesting is because these, the plates, uh, let me try to explain this differently. Joseph had somebody when he was translating the book of Abraham, he had somebody create a printing plate so that these facsimiles, the images on them, could be carved into a, a plate. That plate could then be pressed into ink, and then these images could be put into publication with Joseph Smith's interpretation shared. And so we actually have the carved plate from this. And it's going to be a reverse image because if you can picture this, they'll have the ink. And when it's put down, now you essentially have a reverse image of what you're actually trying to, what you carved out, which would then match the original. Um, so the figure on the left is the slave, which actually is Anubis. And the thing we know about Anubis is Anubis has a snout to him. And there are many within the scholarly world within Mormonism who recognize that Joseph actually may have had an Anubis have a snout in the beginning, but then Joseph removed the snout. So here's a close-up, and you can see, if you follow my cursor, you can see where there was a snout there, and it was carved out. And you can see like this nose is kind of inverted a little bit, and so it turned. it's turned into a representation of a slave, but you still have the horns of Anubis, 
the ears of Anubis, I should say, and you have the original snout having been removed, which is a direct indicator that that Joseph sort of knew he was playing around with the originality of this thing and made it, he, he, he um, altered it in order to fit his need for what he wanted this person to be. And so I simply want to note that. Um, there are lots of indications of the book of Abraham not being an ancient text. I also want to note here uh, of some ancient records that have fallen into our hands from the catacombs of Egypt purporting to be the writings of Abraham while he was in Egypt called the book of Abraham written by his own hand upon papyrus. But now the church no longer claims that. The church even acknowledges that none of the characters on the papyrus fragments mentioned Abraham's name or any of the events recorded in the book of Abraham. In other words, the book is a standard funerary text in Egyptological meaning, and Joseph Smith took something and told everyone it was something else, and then the evidence came forward that showed that that was not the case. The church has had to figure out a new way to position the book of Abraham. And so today, what many Mormons claim, including scholars, and even attested to in the book of Abraham gospel topic essay, if you go on to lds.org or churchofjesuschrist.org, if you look up the gospel topic essays and find the one in the book of Abraham, you'll find the church acknowledge this idea, which is that this is a standard funerary text. Joseph thought it was the book of Abraham, and God allowed him to think it, that having the papyri served as a catalyst for creating the book of Abraham, but that the papyri itself is not the book of Abraham. The problem is that you now have God deceiving Joseph or allowing Joseph to be deceived. Also, the church has walked it back so far now that the way they frame the catalyst theory would be indiscernible from the critics' position of it being a fraud. In other words, both the catalyst theory and an obvious fraud would look exactly the same. Um, and the church does this often, reducing problems, uh, troublesome issues, reducing them back to holding a position where it's indiscernible from being a fraud. Next, Joseph Smith's new translation of the Bible, the inspired translation, Joseph Smith heavily plagiarized from Adam Clark's commentary. So again, he claims that in the, in the early church claims up until the last 10 years, that Joseph Smith was restoring the Bible to its original form, fixing the things that others had corrupted and had taken out. But what we find is that Joseph Smith actually plagiarizes heavily from a contemporary Bible commentary, specifically Adam Clark's Bible commentary. Scholars have walked away from this as a restoration of the corrupted Bible to its original form and now consider the inspired translation by Joseph Smith to be simply a flawed Bible commentary. And then also the book of Moses within it heavily borrows from Matthew and Luke in the New Testament, um, which the book of Moses has no business doing. So let's continue. So this is an article from BYU, Brigham Young University. This is the church-sponsored school. A professor there by the name of Thomas Waymont, as, as well as a student there, Haley Wilson Lamont, they were working on a project together trying to see if they could find any original source material that Joseph Smith would have used for the inspired translation of the Bible. And when they came across Adam Clark's commentary, they found significant overlap. Here's what they say. Our research has revealed that the number of direct parallels between Smith's translation and Adam Clark's biblical commentary are simply too numerous and explicit to posit happenstance or coincidental overlap. The parallels between the two texts number into the hundreds, a number that is well beyond excuse me, limits of this paper to discuss. A few of them, however, demonstrate Smith's open reliance upon Clark and establish that he was inclined to lean on Clark's commentary for matters of history, 
textual questions, clarification of wording, and theological nuance. In presenting the evidence, we have attempted to both establish that Smith drew upon Clark, likely at the urging of Rigdon, and we present here a broad categorization of the types of changes that Smith made when he used Clark as a source. I also want to note that Adam Clark's commentary has pieces and parts of it that also could be seen as being used in the book of Abraham and in other places as well. In other words, once we know that Joseph Smith had access to and was utilizing Adam Clark's commentary, we begin to find pieces of Adam Clark's commentary in several of Joseph Smith's translation productions. They call it directly borrow, direct borrowing, by the way. Um, but direct borrowing is another way of saying plagiarizing, especially when you don't give credit to the original author. And so, you know, I mean, because it is one of those struggles. It kind of relates to the Book of Mormon. Is the Book of Mormon a translation or is it a revelation? Um, and and so the, the Joseph Smith translation, I mean, we use the word translation, and I think the implication is, well, you know, there were lost parts, and Joseph Smith is restoring that. But when you go back to these original Greek and Latin, that's not really what happened, right? It's not there. We don't have any any evidence for that, mm-hmm. especially, you know, these bigger changes that he adds the to the Bible. And then the other thing that's really challenging is there are things like forged verses in the Bible. So First John, the epistle 5-7 that's a known forgery. That's not a question that any of us Is that the Trinity forgery? Yeah. We talked about that last time. The Joannine comma. And so he leaves that in, and that becomes problematic. In Gospel of Mark, our manuscripts end at chapter 16, verse 8, but he leaves 9 through 20 in. So there's there's that one. That, That on its own, what Thomas Wayman is saying is that the Joseph Smith translation is not what Joseph Smith in the early church leaders and the modern church up until a decade ago claimed that it was. And and so we'll play uh, we'll play the next one. Here. Is translation the right word? Should we be using another word? Maybe. I mean, maybe. I know midrash has been thrown around. I don't know if that's a perfect word either. It's not. I don't think any of these words are the ideal words because he's not sitting down with Greek and creating English. This is English to English. So a conversion might be a way. The Joseph Smith conversion? Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so the next one we're going to share here is from a program called Saints Unscripted, and they're talking about the Joseph Smith translation. Again, we have for almost 200 years claimed that this was a restoring of the Bible to its ancient form, fixing the corrupted parts, putting back in the missing parts. But notice now how people are beginning formally connected to the church to frame the Joseph Smith translation. Translation, like that's not a thing. So we don't use it in place of the Bible. We use it as a study companion sometimes, but you don't ever, if you go to an LDS service, they're not going to say, all right, take out your Joseph Smith translations of the Bible (laughs) and open to Matthew 5, right? That's not what's going to happen. It's kind of like, that reminds me when you're saying that, it reminds me of like when you hear um, apostles in general conference giving personal like interpretations or their, what they feel about scriptures. It's just like that. It's just like reading scriptures and then reading one of our apostles talks from general conference side by side. That's like pretty much what it is. It, yeah. it could probably be better described as Joseph Smith commentary on yeah. the Bible. It's essentially like having Joseph Smith in And that's your what some BYU professors call it. Right. Joseph Smith's commentary. Which is cool. Because translation, it just has a weird, like people don't think. They think from one language to another. So I just want you to notice there how framing the Joseph Smith as what it used to be, a translation fixing what had been corrupted in the Bible versus now just being like a flawed Bible commentary. It's like when our leader get up and the leader gets up and he just sort of shares his opinion. It's not really something that we need to give a lot of credibility to. And that's a really strange thing, folks. Uh, I just want to note that. And then one more clip where they sort of say the same thing uh, once again. 
um, they, I mean, you should obviously really appreciate what Joseph Smith gave us with the Joseph Smith translations, but remember it's not canonized for a reason. A lot of it really is just Joseph Smith's commentary, his notes, his thoughts. It's like reading his study journal that he was keeping as he was reading the Bible, which we should, should definitely reference it. We should definitely read it, but remember it's not canonized. Um, so it's not technically scripture and we don't know if he like, yeah, so there's that. Uh, again, for any Mormon who's been in the church for a long time, this would be foreign to them. They would not, they would recognize right away that this is not the way it was taught to them. And so I think that that in and of itself is quite interesting. All right, now let's uh, let's continue, and we'll sort of wrap up here uh, with the last few pieces. So the the next thing is just the Book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price, Book of Moses. Uh, Moses chapter 1 is dependent on the structure and content of Matthew chapter 4 in its construction of the temptation of Moses, transforming Moses into a messianic figure in the same way that the author of Matthew transforms Jesus into a new Moses. The connections between Moses 1 and Matthew 4 can be summarized with the following. Uh, Moses 1.1, 1, 1, Matthew 4.8, up into an exceedingly high mountain. And again, you can just follow each of those, but verse 12, verse 15, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, all have uh, overlap similarities with verses from Matthew chapter 4. And also, I think it's Luke chapter 13 is also utilized, uh, as well as they show here Luke chapter 4. Uh, being utilized in the book of Moses as well. It, whoever the author of the book of Moses is, they're well aware of the New Testament and are using sentence structure, phrases, and uh, thematic material from the New Testament in order to form the book of Moses. And then one that isn't part of church canon, but I think it does at least need mentioned here, there were a group of men in uh, the 1840s, I believe, late 1830s, early 1840s, who came up with a plan to make some modern metal plates with uh, characters on them, bound them with a ring. These aren't very small. They're bell-shaped, just like you see on the screen, but these would fit in the palm of your hand. And they buried them and then tricked a Mormon into helping them dig something and then like, oh, look what we found. And then took those back to Joseph Smith and they're called the Kinderhook plates and Joseph Smith attempted to translate them. Uh, he didn't get very far. And so apologists cling to that and say, well, he didn't translate all of it. He only translated a sentence or two. So that doesn't count. Well, he did get fooled and he did try to translate them. Um, and there's more I could say on that, but it, it, it would just sort of, get us off into the weeds. I want to wrap up by just noting that scholars in the church, as you saw in the videos we just played, there's a debate now whether translation really means translation. Maybe these aren't ancient texts. Maybe Joseph Smith is just receiving revelation. Um, I think this quote by Richard Bushman is interesting. He's a former stake president, uh, patriarch emeritus, stake patriarch emeritus, um, I say emeritus because he know, he moved, and when a patriarch moves, if they're not used as patriarch, they still serve with that office, but they don't actually carry out their calling. But he's an active, faithful scholar in the church, and he says, Joseph Smith's books, books of Moses and Abraham and the writings of Enoch and the book of Moses bear a resemblance to a, this large corpus of scripture in that they came in the form of writings in another person's name. Joseph, meaning Joseph Smith, was producing pseudopigrapha. Pseudopigrapha are falsely attributed works. Their text whose claimed author is not the true author. Richard Bushman is agreeing with the data that Joseph Smith's translation productions don't have the look of ancient text, but rather the evidence points to them being modern productions placed in the name of ancient authors. Hence, none of these, if a rational mind's going to tackle it, none of these are ancient documents translated in the modern moment. They are modern productions attributed to ancient authors. And that, my folks, ends chapter 10.
the scriptures. I hope you have a wonderful day. Take it easy.